and uh, learn how to handle them themselves. Now, some people think that this is a bad thing, that you need a guide, you need a, a spiritual guide, you need a, a teacher that's experienced in their use. And I'm not denying the, the value of that as well. Uh, clearly, that's, uh, that's also important. But information can also be got from books. And, uh, and there are, in fact, in our culture, in the United States, in the late 20th century, there are a number of people that have been using these substances for decades. And uh, they, they, many of them consider themselves to be shamans and call themselves such, and uh, perhaps they are. Perhaps we have developed our own type of shaman, urban shamans, basement shamans, uh, and those are some of the terms that have been used. White shamans is another term that I've heard. And so, uh, but what are the dangers? Now, some would say poisoning, overdose, and so forth. It happens that these substances are remarkably non-toxic as a rule, with a few exceptions if you talk about psilocybin mushrooms or LSD or mescaline or uh, the DMT, that the uh, active or visionary agent in ayahuasca. They're remarkably non-toxic substances, and so the danger of poisoning is, is nil, assuming that one knows what one is getting. Now, when you have these things illegalized by our governments, uh, then you get the problem of adulteration, of misrepresentation, uh, and when where, where black markets are involved. In fact, the authorities are defaulting on their responsibilities to protect the public health in this regard. They, they should be pragmatic and admit that people are going to use these substances whether we like it or not, and it's our responsibility to make sure that they are using them safely. Some of the European governments are already taking this attitude. Uh, Holland is a notable example where they even have uh, heroin mobiles that go around in Amsterdam on a pointed rounds of stops, give medical exams, clean syringes, condoms, uh, and so forth, and, and, and clean, sterile, pure drugs rather than what's available on the black market. So a lot of what are considered to be the problems of toxicity and so forth are not are artifacts of the black market. Now, if people have access, this is one of the reasons why I favor people developing a relationship with the plants and learning to process them themselves, because then they can know what they are getting and, uh, and, and come to master that technology themselves. There's also the danger, I, I will have to say in no uncertain terms, that entheogens are not for everyone. Uh, some people with particular psychological problems find these things to have rather an irritating or exacerbating effect on underlying problems. But usually, in the great majority of the cases, not every case, people of that type, once they've been exposed on a single occasion to substances like this, avoid them like the plague. And there are some few people that uh, have bad reactions to them that seek them out and keep self-administering them. But, um, uh, well, people hurt themselves in many ways, uh, not just with drugs. And so, uh, but there, I don't feel it's particularly dangerous in the context of modern urban life in Los Angeles, for example. There are many things, I think, just going down the freeway is probably more dangerous than, than uh cruising the freeways of the mind with entheogens. Do you have any inkling on how widespread the use is of entheogenic plants? In the United States? In the U.S. and in the well, world? Well, the government did a telephone survey some years ago, <laughs> and uh, of course you, you could legitimately ask how many people are going to tell the truth about their illicit drug use when the government phones up and says, we want to know. Uh, and nevertheless, just from that phone survey, the government estimated one million users in the United States. So I would say we have to at least double and probably quadruple that figure to get at a, a, a more realistic estimate. Not talking about cannabis, just talking about ayahuasca, mushrooms, LSD, mescaline-type drugs. Uh, I would say we're probably looking, just a ballpark estimate, three to five million in the United States, or some, something around one to two percent of the population. Uh, fairly small. Uh, on a worldwide basis, it may actually be, I, it's hard to say. I, we really don't know enough to be able to say, but uh, maybe that would apply on a worldwide basis. Maybe the chances are the use is maybe heavier in the U.S. than it is in some countries. Hmm. Now, uh, there's a new book that I have not seen, uh, which is just out. Yes. And it is called The Age of Entheogens and the Angel's Dictionary. Yes. To go into some detail about what, uh, what, you, what you've done with this 
Yes, gladly. Okay. Uh, the first essay, it's a, a fairly short essay, uh, The Agent and Theogens, the Pharmacratic Inquisition, and the Entheogenic Reformation. And this is an historical theory regarding the importance and history of use of these plant teachers or plant sacraments. And so basically I talk about what my teacher Gordon Wasson called the age of entheogens or the preliterate world in general or what some people choose to call the primitive world. Uh, I don't, or primitive cultures, I don't use that term because it, it automatically makes us advanced without having to do anything to earn that qualification. And uh, it was What some, do you mean? We do war, child abuse. <laughs> Um, environmental pollution with the best of environmental destruction and genocide all oh. right and so um, so I use the term preliterate some people object to that but it more or less gets the point across so uh, the age of entheogens is that era in human cultural development or religious evolution shall we say in which the entheogens reigned supreme uh, not just in a shamanic context but also in as Com communal substances in organized religions, like the famous Eleusinian Mysteries in ancient Greece. Um, and the age of entheogens still lives on today in, in Amazonia, in the remote parts of the Sierra Madre in Mexico, and in other countries. But, but basically, for purposes of historical theor theory making and so forth, I I established that in the book that the age of entheogens in the old world, or I call it also Paleogea, ended at the end of the fourth century, strictly speaking in the year 395 AD, or exactly 1600 years ago this year, when the Eleusinian mystery cult was destroyed by the goth king Alaric, putting an end to an organized religious communion that had endured for almost 2,000 years and involved an annual initiatory rite in which the... Um, the mistes or initiates were given a potion called the kikion, or which means mixture, and it seems to have been a potion containing um, psychoactive or entheogenic ergot alkaloids. And then they experienced a great vision, and uh, which converted them into epoptes, those who had seen, and uh, or epoptai is the plural, and so uh, from miste to epoptai, and so. The age of entheogens drew to a, a dramatic close at the end of the fourth century in Europe, and uh, several events preceded the destruction of the Eleusinian Mysteries. Notably, Constantine uh, reunified the year Roman Empire had been fragmented into three branches, and in the year 324, Constantine re reunified the Roman Empire. The following year, he convened the famous Council of Nicaea, in which 300 Christian bishops codified a particular dogmatic version of the Christian faith, and and uh, some years later, Christianity was officially declared the state religion of the Roman Empire, and in, in a very dramatic fashion, the Christians went from food for the lions in the Colosseum to the avenging persecutors of the pagan past. And uh, by by the uh, the the year 384, another significant event was the conversion of Augustine from the Manichaean religion, which was an entheogen-based religion, to Christianity, and he immediately denounced the Manichaeans and, uh, and went on to become a very important force in Christian philosophy. By the year 391, uh, the emperor, then the emperor was Theodosius I. He decreed not only expropriation of the property of all of the pagan temples, but illegalized any other religion in the Roman Empire besides Christianity. In that same year, the Bishop Theophilus I of Alexandria led one of the great destructions of ancient art and literature in the Library of Alexandria. And uh, four years later, the Goth King Alaric destroyed the, the sanctuary at Eleusis and put an end to the Eleusinian Mysteries, which was really the, a type of spiritual beacon or or omphalos, or, or spiritual center of the ancient world. This really marked the ascendancy of this new religion, the Christian religion. And so uh, the, the age of entheogens, we can say, pretty definitely came to an end in the year 395 in, in the old world. And then there succeeded a, a, a thousand-year reign of terror of uh, the, the, the Christian theocracy, the, the, the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church of Rome, destroying any of the competing religions. And why were they so vigorously trying to do this? Because their religion was based on a placebo sacrament. The sacrament had been reduced to a mere symbol, and uh, 